Hello and welcome to Insight of Thalmology. This is Dr. Amrit and today we are studying the anatomy of cornea. The cornea is the transparent part of the eye that covers the iris and pupil and allows the light to enter inside. It is a misnomer to say that the cornea is the black part of the eye because the cornea is actually transparent and it looks black or brownish in color because of the underlying uh, pigmentation of the iris. Now let us try to understand what is cornea anatomically. As we all know that our eyeball is basically covered by three main coats. The outer fibrous coat, the middle vascular coat which is called the choroid and the innermost coat which is the nervous coat also called the retina. Now in the, the posterior 5 sixth of the outer coat of the eyeball forms basically the sclera. And the anterior 1 sixth of the outer coat of the eyeball forms our cornea. Coming to the topography of the cornea, if you consider the surfaces of the cornea, the anterior surface of the cornea is basically elliptical, right? And the posterior surface of the cornea, however, is spherical. The average diameter of the cornea is about 11.5 millimeter, in which the horizontal diameter of the anterior surface of the cornea, which is here, is about 11.7 mm and the vertical diameter is about 11 mm right so the horizontal diameter of the anterior surface of cornea is more compared to the vertical diameter and this happens because of the force which is applied on the anterior surface of the cornea by our lids right so because of that constant vertical force the cornea is horizontally oval or elliptical and that is the reason the horizontal corneal diameter is more than the vertical corneal diameter and that is also the reason why uh, with the rule in with the rule astigmatism the vertical meridian is more uh, convex compared to the horizontal meridian the radius of curvature of the cornea is about 8 millimeters or 7.8 millimeters as referred in certain books now let us see what is meant by the radius of curvature of the cornea. So this is the cornea and the anterior 1 6 and if you draw a circle around the cornea and take its radius of its radius the radius of that circle from which the cornea is formed is about 8 mm and that is the radius of curvature of the cornea. Similarly, the radius of curvature of the sclera can be found out by considering a circle of, uh, from which the sclera is derived and its radius will be the radius of curvature of sclera which is about 12 mm. Now, whenever the cornea is smaller, that is the horizontal corneal diameter is less than 10 mm, it is called microcornea as shown over here. Then when the horizontal corneal diameter is more than 13 mm, then that cornea is called a macro cornea. Now, this picture over here represents the slit lamp image of a slit section on a slit lamp, right, of the cornea. So, as you can see, this slit basically represents a optical beam or a slit which is taken from the slit lamp and this is the anterior surface and this is the posterior surface of the cornea and this slit will actually represent the thickness of the cornea. Now, the central corneal thickness is about 0.52 millimeters, which is also 520 micrometers. And the peripheral thickness is, however, 0.67 millimeters or 670 micrometers. So you can see that it is the peripheral cornea which is thicker compared to the central cornea. Similarly, in the slit also, it can be seen that the peripheral cornea is more thicker compared to the central cornea. Again, you can see that in this image that the peripheral cornea is more thicker, about 670 microns, compared to the central corneal thickness, which is about 520 microns on average. The central corneal thickness is very important because it has a very important effect on the IOP measurements, right? Yeah. The central 5 mm of cornea is the most powerful refracting surface and nearly three-fourths of the total power of the eyeball comes from the cornea. 
okay so this is the central for 5 millimeter area which is the most important refracting surface of the eyeball so let us see the, uh, let us talk about the refractive power of the cornea and the eyeball so this represents the refractive power of the cornea so the cornea itself has a power of about plus 45 diopters next what we have is the lens and you can see that the lens has a power of about plus 15 diopters and if you actually add both of them the total dioptric power of the eyeball will come to about plus 60 diopters right so plus indicates that the light the eyeball is actually acting as a converging lens now let us talk about the refractive indexes of certain important structures in the eye for the air it is about 1. The refractive index of air or normal atmosphere is about 1. The refractive index of cornea which is very important to remember is about 1.37. The refractive index of the aqueous humor or the anterior chamber is about 1.33 which is less than the cornea. The refractive index of our lens is about 1.42. The refractive index of the vitreous humor is about 1.33. So what happens is that whenever the rays of light are going from a, uh, a medium which has less refractive index to a medium of more refractive index, they will undergo basically convergence. So whenever the rays of light will pass from air to cornea, at the air corneal interface, they are going to undergo convergence. Similarly, as they encounter the aqueous humor and the lens interface, again convergence will occur and it is because of this converging ability that we will get an image focused onto the retina. Now let us talk about the histology of the cornea or basically the layers of the cornea. As you can see, the layers of cornea over here are number one, the epithelium. Number two, the Bowman's membrane. Below that we have the stroma, which is the collagen layer. And then we have the desmet membrane. And finally, we are having the endothelium present. So the layers of the cornea can actually be remembered with a mnemonic of A, B, C, D, E. A means anteriorly we have the epithelium. B means then we have the Bowman's membrane. C is stands for collagen in the stroma. D is the Desmet's membrane and E is the endothelium. Now they say that instead of five layers we actually have six layers in the cornea and one new layer which has been added by the work of Dr. Harminda Dua is the predesmets layer also called Dua's layer after its founder. The Dua's layer is nothing but it is a layer which is present just uh, anterior to our desmets membrane or we can say just posterior to the stroma or you can also say that Dua's layer is a layer which is present between the stroma and the desmet membrane and therefore it is also called the predesmets membrane. Now let us talk about from where are these layers taking its origin or let us talk about the embryology. The corneal epithelium is actually derived from the surface ectoderm right and the remaining layers that is the stroma desmet membrane and the endothelium they are all coming from the paraaxial mesoderm so we can say that it is only the epithelium which is ectodermal and remaining the entire uh, layers of the cornea are actually mesodermal in origin now let us talk about these layers in a little bit more detail first let us talk about the corneal epithelium 10% of the entire thickness of the cornea is formed by this epithelium and the corneal epithelium is actually a stratified, squamous, non-keratinized epithelium. Okay, and there are desmosomes and hemidesmosomes. So let me tell you what are those. First of all, the corneal epithelium is stratified, squamous, non-keratinized. Stratified means stratified is an epithelium in which multiple layers are present. And since in the corneal epithelium we have about five to six layers, the corneal epithelium is stratified. Number two, they are squamous cells. So all these cells over here, they are squamous cells and they are non-keratinized. That means they are nucleated, but they do not have any keratin. So the squamous cells of our skin are actually keratinized because they have that dead tissue. However, in cornea, the epithelium is non-keratinized. 
and over here what i want you to see is that the different types of cells which are present so at the base we have these cells which are called the basal lamina then we have certain bigger uh, cells which are called the wing cells the wing cells are again converting into the superficial cells on top and finally we have this topmost layer which is actually thrown into these folds and these folds are called microvilli and above the microvilli we will have our tears forming a tear film so our microvilli are actually covered by certain uh, connective tissues which is called the glycocalyx and this glycocalyx will be actually dipping inside the tear film and it is this microvilli which will help in adhesion and stability of the tear film that means uh, usually we, the tear film actually keeps our cornea moist and transparent if the tear film gets uh, uh, was not stable it will get evaporated very soon leaving us with dry eyes but that does not happen because our microvilli are constantly functioning and they are because of their glycocalyx they are actually keeping the tear film stable right now all these cells if it would they were to get damaged it would take about seven days for the replacement of the entire corneal epithelium now all these cells are actually kept together by desmosomes and hemidesmodome remember that the desmosomes actually will link the two cells together so these two similar cells are going to be uh, kept together by linkages which are called the desmosomes however there are something called hemidesmosomes okay which will attach these cells to the basal lamina like this okay so the the connections which are linking the cells to each other are called the desmosomes and the connections which are linking the cells to the basal lamina are called the hemidesmosomes. Now as I already told you that the epithelium can be divided into the superficial squamous cell layer, the middle wing cell layer and the innermost basal cell layer. Among these three the basal cells are the only one which are capable of mitosis or dividing. So these new cells which are formed from the basal cells are actually pushed anteriorly and thereby transforming their shape uh, and transforming into the wing cells. These cells will continue to move anteriorly and finally they are going to become the superficial cells after which the superficial cells are going to get disintegrated they will lose their attachments they will lose their desmosomes they will be broken and finally they are going to be shed into the tear film in our corneal epithelium also we have the epithelium stem cells which are the undifferentiated pluripotent cells which actually serve as a very important source for the new corneal epithelium generations these are actually found in the limbal basal epithelium of the palisades of Vogt. So this is the limbus that is the junction between the cornea and the conjunctiva. And at this place near the limbus we can see certain striated areas and these are called the palisades of Vogt. So these palisades of Vogt will actually harbor all the stem cells and this uh, it is through this amplification of these stem cells that the basal cells will be formed and then these basal cells will grow and they will form the wing cells, the superficial cells and finally the epithelium will get regenerated. The basal cells were actually connected with the basal basal lamina and uh, with the help of hemidesmosomes. This basal lamina is actually an extracellular secretory product of the basal epithelium cells and its main function is to attach the corneal epithelium with the stroma. Once this basal lamina is destroyed, it will take about six weeks for the basal lamina to regenerate. However, if the basal lamina is normal and only an epithelial defect is present, it will take about 7 days to replace the entire epithelium, provided the basal lamina is normal. So it takes 7 days for the replacement of the entire epithelium. Now let us talk about the Bowman's membrane. The Bowman's membrane is actually an acellular tough membrane or a zone which is situated in between the corneal epithelium and the stroma. 
it is about 8 to 14 micrometers thick and you can remember it as about 10 micrometers thick and it is actually composed of randomly arranged collagen fibers and since our stroma is also made up of collagen fibers many people consider Bowman's membrane to be a condensation and the anterior condensation of the stroma it is however comparatively very resistant to stroma what i mean to say is that the bowman's membrane does not get damaged so easily however if it does get damaged it, if it does get destroyed it cannot be regenerated the next layer of the cornea is the corneal stroma or the substantia propria about 90 percent of the total corneal thickness as you can see is occupied by the corneal stroma the corneal stroma has three main components, the collagen fibrils which will form 70% of the dry weight of the cornea, the keratocytes that is the cells which will actually secrete this collagen fibrils and the extracellular ground substance which is nothing but the supporting tissue. The extracellular ground substance which is present in cornea can be the keratin sulfate and the dermatin sulfate. So as I told you that the corneal stroma actually consists of the keratocytes. These keratocytes will secrete the collagen fibrils and along with that we have the supporting structures which is the extracellular ground matrix. The collagen fibers are actually uniform in shape and diameters and they are arranged in flat bundles which are called the corneal lamellae. These lamellae are about 300 in number and they are actually arranged very regularly. There are two important points that I want you to remember which are very important with respect to transparency of the cornea. And these two points are number one, the collagen fibers are highly uniform in diameter. That means all the collagen fibers are of the same size. Number two, and they are arranged in such a way that the distance between the two collagen fibers will always be equal and highly uniform. These two factors are very important for maintaining the transparency of the cornea. Now, there were two theories which were proposed in order to understand or in order to explain why the cornea is transparent. Now, we all know that the cornea is the major refracting surface of the eyeball about consisting of about plus 45 diopters of the total power of the eye. And therefore, if this uh, structure is not transparent, there will be a lot of problems and uh, we might not be able to see. And therefore, maintaining its transparency is a very important task. So, two theories explain it. Number one is the Morris theory and number two is the lattice theory. The Morris theory says that the corneal lamellae or the corneal collagen fibers are actually arranged in a regular lattice arrangement. That means if these are the corneal lamellae, you can see that how they are arranged. They are actually arranged in a hexagonal pattern in which around every corneal uh, uh, collagen lamellae, we have about this six um, surrounding collagen lamellae and they are arranged actually in a form of a hexagon and they are all uniformly arranged in such a way that they are separated by a distance which is less than the wavelength of the light right so if this is considered to be the wavelength of light you can see the distance between the two collagen lamellae is very very small even smaller than the wavelength of light so what happens is if any light does undergo any scattering they will all get cancelled from each other by the phenomena of destructive interference and therefore we will not have any scattering or any haziness of the cornea and the cornea will look crystal clear and transparent. So this is the Morris theory also called the lattice theory. Now, the next theory is actually the Goldman theory. The Goldman theory says that the lattice arrangement is not important. Okay. So, remember that the Morris theory says that the cells, uh, the lamellae or the collagen fibrils are actually arranged at uniform distance from each other and they are arranged in the form of lattice, that means hexagonal arrangement. However, the Goldman theory will is saying that the lattice arrangement is actually not important. Okay. As long as the size of the lamellae is less than 
than half the wavelength of the light so it comes to about 200 nanometers or 2000 angstroms right so what it says is that these cells uh, these collagen fibers uh, even if they are arranged in lattice or even if they are not arranged in lattice it does not matter as long as their size is less than half the wavelength of the light so what happens is that so the corneal edema however is actually explained by the morris theory so in the morris theory as it is stated that the cells are arranged in the form of a lattice with uniform distance from each other so what happens in corneal edema is that we develop certain lakes or collection of fluid or fluid pockets into the cornea so what happens the distance between the cells will actually increase and as the distance between the cells will increase the the phenomena of destructive interference which was preventing the haziness and scattering of light is now nullified and now the patient will manifest corneal edema now what are the various important reasons as to why our cornea is transparent so number one is the optically smooth tear film our tear film is very smooth and it is very stable and that is the reason cornea is getting nice nutrition and therefore it is clear number two is the role of corneal epithelium our corneal epithelium is also compactly arranged and its arrangement is such that our cornea is transparent moreover it also gets regenerated from time to time and it keeps the cornea fresh and transparent the third is the ar arrangement of the stromal fibers as i already told you the morris and the lattice theory that is the uniform arrangement of the uh, collagen lamellae their size is also uniform so these two factors will contribute to the transparency of the cornea then the cornea does not have any blood right so there is a vascularity in cornea corn does not have any blood vessels and therefore it is clear and then corneal uh, however does have nerves but these nerves do not have myelination and since they do not have myelination cornea is transparent now let us talk about the fifth layer which is the predesmets membrane or also called the duas layer this duas layer is about 15 microns in thickness and it is present between the stroma and the desmet membrane now because it is present just before or anterior to the desmet membrane it is called a predesmet membrane now despite its thinness this layer is actually very strong and it is impervious to air and this factor that is it's impervious to air is actually used in the development of various new surgeries like the predesmet endothelial keratoplasty which is called the pdec the dalk and the new dalks with the uh, uh, bubble techniques that is the bubble type 1 bubble and type 2 bubbles which were actually developed based on the development of and the discovery of the duas layer now let us talk about the desmet membrane desmet membrane is nothing but it is a thick basement membrane which is secreted by the endothelial cells so the innermost layer of the cornea is the endothelium and they are sitting on the basement membrane and that basement membrane is nothing but our desmet membrane the desmet membrane is constantly produced so and also it thickens throughout the life so in a child the desmet membrane is going to be about 3 micrometers and then in adults because it keeps on constantly thickening throughout the life it becomes about 10 micrometers now the desmet membrane is however very weakly attached to the stroma and it is however resistant to the enzymatic degradation by the phagocytes and toxins so what happens is whenever uh, a person has a corneal ulcer the bacterial toxins and the subsequent inflammation which comes along with infection will degrade the epithelium cause an epithelial defect will cause melting of the stroma called the infiltrate and it will reach the desmet however the desmet will not get degraded by the phagocytes and toxin and it will remain uh, actually intact and then what happens is as the iop is going to increase inside the eyeball this desmet membrane is going to protrude through that thin out cornea and that protrusion is called desmeto seal which is nothing but the herniation of the desmet membrane through the thinned out cornea because of the raised iop 
Now let us talk about the innermost layer of the cornea which is the corneal endothelium. The corneal endothelial cells are also squamous cells but they are hexagonal in shape and they are continuous with each other forming a mosaic pattern which is best seen on specular microscopy. These endothelial cells are actually interconnected with each other using various junctional complexes like zonular occludens, macular occludens and the macular adherence. Now these cells have a very important role in maintaining the state of relative hydration in cornea. That means why it is called relative hydration because the percentage of hydration in cornea is about 70%. Okay, It's not 100, it's not 80, it's not 90, it is 70 and it has to maintain that 70% uh, relative hydration in order to for it to remain transparent and this is possible because of the presence of endothelial pumps and because of the presence of certain ion transport systems which are present in the endothelium. So this picture over here actually shows the endothelial pump and you can see there are so many channels which are present in the uh, endothelial cells and this endothelial pump is very important for pumping out the excessive water from the cornea back into the aqueous humor and this is a very important function of the endothelial cells. Now. As I told you that the endothelial cells also have certain tight junctions and gap junctions. However, they are not as tight as the desmosomes and the hemidesmosomes. And these tight junctions will actually allow some of the water to flow from the aqueous humor to the uh, cornea that is towards the stroma, right? So this is called leakage of the uh, water and this barrier is actually not so tight and therefore it is called a leaky barrier. So we do need some pump which can pump out this excessive water which has entered the stroma back towards the aqueous humor and that pump is called the endothelial pump. Now this endothelial metabolic pump, it it works in such a way that it actually pushes out the sodium first from the cornea towards the aqueous humor and in doing so it will create an osmotic gradient that is a gradient which is created because of the passage of sodium and the sodium wherever sodium goes water follows so once the sodium is pushed out from the cornea back to the aqueous humor using this endothelial pump slowly the water will also follow from the stroma to the aqueous in order to maintain a relative state of corneal hydration which is about 70 percent. Let us try to understand this endothelial metabolic pump a little bit in detail. Let us consider this to be one endothelial cells and this is the surrounding endothelial cells. Now over here we have the basal part that is the desmid membrane and the stroma. So this is the inferior part of the screen, screen is the corneal side and the superior part of the screen is actually the aqueous humor. And now we have to move the water from the cornea towards the aqueous humor. Now over here is the basolateral part of the endothelial cells and this basolateral part of the endothelial cell is actually composed of an important, uh, uh, important channel which is called the sodium potassium ATPase. The sodium potassium ATPase as the name suggests we'll use the ATP, the energy used from this ATP to pump out three sodiums out from the endothelial cell into the basolateral space, right? And in turn, what will happen is the two potassiums will actually come out. Right? So these three sodiums which have actually come out from the basolateral membrane will now have to go back inside and they will go back using the sodium hydrogen anti-transport. Right? So what happened is that the sodium which came out will now enter back into the endothelial cells okay, from the stroma using this anti-transport and for the exchange of the sodium what is happening the potassium is actually coming the hydrogen is coming out into the stroma. Now in order to push this sodium out into the aqueous humor again there is a co-transporter which will push the sodium out with the bicarbonate also. Right. So what is happening now since there is so much acidification of the stroma because of this hydrogen which is coming out. Now the carbon dioxide is going to move into the endothelial cell from the stroma.
This carbon dioxide will now combine with the water and using the carbonic anhydrase enzyme will again split into the hydrogen and bicarbonate. This bicarbonate will be pushed out to the aqueous using the co-transporter and along with it it will take the sodium outside. This is what we wanted. We wanted we want to push the sodium outside into the aqueous humor. And in turn what we get is a hydrogen ion and this hydrogen ion will be again forced back into the stroma and along with that what are we getting back into the endothelium we are getting the sodium back right so basically three main uh, transporters are working we have the sodium potassium atps which is pushing the sodium into the stroma and then this sodium is again coming out into the endothelium using the sodium hydrogen uh, anti-transport and then the sodium is again pushed back into the aqueous humor using the bicarbonate co-transport so what is happening there is a net going out going uh, net efflux of the sodium from the cornea into the aqueous humor and wherever sodium goes our water is going to follow and therefore water is also moving out from the stroma going into the aqueous humor and thereby we are getting a 70 percent state of relative dehydration or relative hydration in the cornea so this is the importance of endothelial cells right so they are very important and such important cells however do not have any capacity to divide or any capacity to replicate with aging the cell density of the endothelium is going to decrease which is then however compensated by increase in the size which is called polymegathism or increase or different shapes which is called pleomorphism so what i mean to say is if this was the cornea and its endothelium then endothelium cells are hexagonal and they are arranged uniformly in a mosaic pattern however if this part of the endothelial cell is damaged now we cannot regenerate this endothelial cell however the surrounding cells will try to fill up this gap by increasing their size or they will change their shape so that is called polymegathism or pleomorphism right now as these endothelial cells are involved in the corneal hydration which i told you right just now the endothelial pump the endothelial cell density whenever it falls below 800 cells per millimeter cube it is very dangerous for cornea and that time the endothelial pump cannot function well and that is called corneal decompensation right so in the process of of corneal decompensation or in the disease of corneal decompensation the cornea can actually not push out excess water from its uh, stroma to the aqueous humor and that is called corneal decompensation and it occurs when the endothelial cells will fall below a critical point of about 800 cells per millimeter cube so as I told you that the kids will have maximum amount of endothelial cells and it is about three to four thousand cells per millimeter cube in the adolescence, it is about 2.5 cells per uh, millimeter cube and as we become old in the old age, it is about 2000 cells per millimeter cube. So this is the healthy, healthy mosaic of the endothelial cells. You can see they are all hexagonal and over here in this, uh, in this specular picture, you can see that the cells are of various shapes and this is called pleomorphism and here the cells have actually become larger and this is called polymega. Let's try to understand the corneal response to injury in brief. So whenever there is an injury to the epithelium of the cornea, what happens is that the epithelium will respond immediately to establish the barrier action and protect the underlying tissue Okay, to the best of its ability. I told you already how the basal cells are actually proliferating and the pluripotent stem cells are actually present in the palisades of worked from where they will start proliferating and the basal cells will actually replace the entire corneal epithelium in about 7 days. Now, whenever there's damage, however, to the Bowman's membrane, Bowman's membrane has about no mechanism for repair. Coming to the mechanism for stroma, the keratinocytes are actually the modified fibro fibrocytes and they can actually produce colla reparative collagen, right? This reparative collagen is not a perfect collagen and once there is damage and once there, uh, the, uh, the inflammatory cells also come into that place, the mechanism of repair is not very uh perfect and foolproof and what happens is that 
whenever there is repair going on in the stroma the transparency of the cornea will be compromised coming to the desmet membrane desmet membrane will be again resecreted by the corneal endothelium and damage to the corneal endothelium there is no mechanism to repair the endothelium can actually the remaining endothelial cells may try to increase their size and increase their shape change their shape however below a critical number when the endothelial cells will fall that is about 800 cells per millimeter cube corneal decompensation will start so as i told you that whenever the stroma is damaged whenever the stromal repair is occurring there will it will always lead to corneal opacity and the corneal transparency will be compromised so whenever uh, the bowman's membrane and the superficial part of the stroma is involved like this we get a superficial opacity and that superficial opacity is called the corneal nebula okay now when one third of the stroma is involved like this this is called the macular corneal opacity and when more than half of the stroma as you can see over here is involved then the type of opacity that we get is called leukomatous corneal opacity now let us talk about the blood supply of cornea in normal condition cornea does not contain any blood vessels right the anterior ciliary artery which is a branch of the ophthalmic artery actually will form a vascular arcade in the limbal area and it helps actually helps in the corneal metabolism and provides all the nourishment for the wound repair so this absence of blood vessel in the uh, cornea actually makes it one of the contributing factors for its transparency the nerve supply of cornea also cornea is highly sensitive tissue of the human body about 300 times more sensitive and has more density of the nerves than the skin okay and uh, the cornea is actually innervated by the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve and the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve has about three parts as we all know it is the frontal the lacrimal and the nasociliary it is the nasociliary nerve which is a branch of the ophthalmic division which is in turn a branch of the trigeminal nerve which will give sensory innervation to the cornea so as you can see this is the trigeminal ganglion which will give three parts the ophthalmic division the maxillary and the mandibular division the ophthalmic division again has three parts that is the frontal the trochlear and the nasociliary and it is a nasociliary nerve which will again give a branch which is called the long posterior ciliary nerves which is traveling as you can see along the eyeball and then it is piercing the sclera over here and then coming around the limbus so when it reaches the limbus from there they are going to divide and form three main plexus in the cornea these three plexus are the stromal plexus that is the part which is present in the stroma the subepithelial plexus which is present just below the epithelium right so this is called the subepithelial also called the subbasal plexus and over here we have the stromal plexus and then we have the plexus which is actually traveling straight into the epithelium and this is nothing but the epithelial intraepithelial or epithelial plexus so loss of corneal epithelium what happens is that whenever there is a corneal epithelial defect the, epi the intraepithelial nerves will be exposed and that severe pain what we get after a corneal epithelial defect is basically because of the exposed corneal nerve ending while doing a slit line examination sometimes the corneal nerves can be seen as very thin fibers and in normal condition they are very visible in the periphery as the diameters of these uh, corneal nerves are much larger in the peripheries compared to the center because once they reach center they are constantly dividing and therefore the diameter of the central corneal nerve is much thinner compared to the uh, peripheral nerves now one more important uh, clinical point that you can remember with respect to the corneal nerve is in relation with the herpes simplex virus infection which actually locates into the uh, which becomes inactive and lives inside the trigeminal ganglion and therefore whenever there is an infection with hsv there will be reduced corneal sensation because of the damage to these nerve endings so this was briefly about the anatomy of cornea i hope it was useful for you and if it was kindly share the knowledge thank you and have a nice day Thank you.